Okay, we're going to start this episode with Father Gabriel singing a song. Any song. <laughs> Any song we want. <laughs> Next time you come, I'm going to have to learn how to make saxophone sounds. And if you can bring in the trumpet, and I can bring can in you the do, saxophone. Can you do Kenny G? Can you do Kenny G? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Just some smooth. That's Harlem. That's I'm sure. Totally Harlem. Totally Harlem. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Beyond Damascus, the show where encounter meets mission. My name is Dan Dimite, and I'm joined here today with Aaron Richards hey, and Brad Pierron. Yes, sir. And our guest, Father Gabriel Whoa. Emmanuel from right the yeah. Come on, come on. Yes. All right, so before the episode, you were making some weird noises with your mouth. Can we just, <laughs> can we, can we start with that? I, feel I like don't know what you're talking about. Radio. When I was growing up. Yes. Eighth grade. Yeah. The biggest dance song was Sandstorm. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> anyway. Right, nice. That's, that's, that's incredible. So you, that's these amazing. noises just come out of your mouth. I was number seven of eight, so I had to yeah. I had to find my way. Yeah. I found your niche. And I found my niche. Okay, so it was more about like as, as a child. I was wondering if it was like you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Instead of speaking in tongues, you just started making like noises. I can claim that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, when the CFRs get baptized in the spirit, they start beatboxing. (laughs) There are as many gifts as there are individuals uh, in the kingdom. That's amazing. Okay, so if you're new to our podcast, this is a show where Encounter Meets Mission, like St. Paul who encountered uh, Jesus on the road to Damascus Mm -hmm. and then was propelled to mission. We have to be missionary disciples who encounter the living God, but we don't stop there. We are driven to a life of full-time mission for the gospel. So this is going to be mm-hmm. an incredible time. Father Gabriel's here with us. We're going to have a lot of fun. Brad, do you want to open us in prayer? Yeah, I can. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm, amen. amen. Lord, thank you for the gift that it is to be called missionary disciples. Thank you for the gift of mission, for all the ways that you send us out on your behalf to represent you in the world. And God, today, as we're speaking about this topic that's near and dear to your heart, this topic of mission, mm-hmm. we pray that you would make us more like you as we listen to the wisdom shared here today. As we become more like you, help us to live more focused on the other so that we can bring all people back to you in the fullness of time. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. 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 Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So, Father, why don't you just start us with like sharing a little bit about if people don't know who the CFRs are, like what do you guys do and who you who are you as a community? What do we do? We're not Star Wars. We don't do Jedi. Oh, yeah. You 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 just make noises with your mouth. We do make special noises. We do make special noises. So, Franciscan Friars of Renewal began in 1987. Eight Capuchin Friars who left the Capuchins, and felt a call to begin again, back to basics. Um, very close with Cardinal Connor, and uh, were given a friary and a closed church in the Bronx, and they just started by throwing out the air conditioners and stripping the rugs, and okay, how do we serve the poor? How do we play, pray as brothers? How do we live as brothers? And just back to the gospel, back to the basics. So you got a place with air condition, and you threw the air condition and away. And we the condition yes. That was the first move. Yes, that, that was the first so move. So Franciscan. I like it. Okay, that's awesome. And why the Bronx? Like, was that just because that's who would invite you, or was there a specific call to the Bronx? Uh, I Yeah, I think in the providence of the Father, it gave us the flavor. You know, I, I think it was the only church that was... That was uh, um, closed that was in a poor neighborhood. And that was one of our, you know, what the brothers were looking for when they began being in a closed. It was, back then it was Fort Apache. It was pretty, pretty rough. Um, so, but it, it gave us the flavor. It gave mm-hmm. us the flavor. Like, even even in um, France, where Les Frères de Bronx, you know, it's like <laughs> the brothers from the Bronx. Yeah. And, um, and it gave us this, um, it, at, just as St. Francis, when he repaired the Portiunca, the, the Angels. It was right next to our leprosarium. He was always maintaining con- close contact with the poor. Uh, for us, staying in close neighborhoods is in poor neighborhoods is very, very important for us. So. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. And I love how you wear the CFR habit and you're part of that community. But also, mm-hmm. like, who are you as a person? Like, how did how did you encounter the living God and how did Jesus capture your heart? Mm. Okay, well, we're going to jump right in. Yeah. We're jumping right <laughs> I'm in. Jumping right jumping in. Right I want right to right know. In. I want to know. <laughs> Let's do this. Lay this foundation. Uh, I think... I had a good I had a good foundation growing up. Seven of eight kids. 
uh, my older brother was is a priest now. He was already religious when I was in high school. Uh, college, the Game Changer was my first retreat with a group called the um, Apostles of the Interior Life. Good, good community sisters. I don't know if you've heard of them. Really focused on um, college students developing their interior life. And so Sister Susan was, uh, she could smell I was fresh. She knew <laughs> she knew I was ready. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I, I look back and just how she pursued me uh, on that retreat. You want to go for a walk? Sure, sister. I had no idea what I was getting into. Should we go for an hour walk? We passed by the cemetery. Look at that. Time is pretty short, huh? I was like, oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good technique. Oh, I haven't tried technique. that one. I'm yes. writing down those for missionary yeah. recruiting. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> she knew exactly what she was doing. Yeah. Exactly what she was doing. <laughs> anyway, so we're walking, and she just challenged me. Like, have you? do you know God's plan for your life? No, sister. And have you ever talked with a spiritual director? Do you have daily prayer? Do you have... When's the last time you've gone to confession? I went last semester, sister. That's fine. You should go every month. Oh, okay, sister. You know, like, <laughs> uh -huh. just this clarity and this really um, real tenderness, which she pursued me and invited me into this relationship to pursue with the Lord, that it's not just this thing I do on Sunday. But um, mm -hmm. So that was, I would say, that retreat plus a good community of uh, friends at Notre Dame there and um, changed everything, mm -hmm. really changed everything. It's amazing. I love that the the way you describe Sister Susan because I feel like sometimes our mm -hmm. our uh, conversations with people when we're like leading them in discipleship is a little reactive as opposed to proactive. Mm -hmm. uh, proactive, where it's like mm -hmm. kind of like, "Hey, how are you doing?" and you just kind of react to what the person throws out there. But it sounds like she's like, mm -hmm. "I know what I'm going to ask." She you. went, like, in. "Do you yeah. know God's plan for your life?" Like that's pretty yeah. proactive. That's a bold statement. Very bold. Yeah, Very yeah. Bold. I love that. Br Brad, what do you do when you when you're like walking with someone? <laughs> yeah. You don't take them to a graveyard. We don't what, go by what's your, what's your approach? No, I, uh, I, I, well, there's a couple different things. I think, uh, as, as I'm thinking about approach, one thing that I think is amazing is, um, that father Gabriel is bringing up when it comes to CFRs and about his, um, life individually is that you have to meet a person where they're at, right? Like you have to like at, at a college campus, right? There's people that have a way of life at a college campus and you engage them in what they're doing then. And that's what I love about the CFRs is they actually committed to the Bronx, right? They started living life in the Bronx and that, actually from there provided their call because they were living life to the full where the father had them then. So the first thing I try to do when I'm getting together with college students is to really ask what they're doing. Like, how are you getting involved on your campus? Like, are you involved in Bible studies here? What's discipleship look like? Like, do you have a small group that you're meeting with regularly? Like, what's your life look like in that? And, and if they're not investing there yet, encouraging them to invest there, because as they begin investing there, that missionary heart will begin developing, right? Like, if I'm investing in the student center at my campus, I start to see areas of need, and I'm like, wait, I have a gift for that area of need. And then I start filling that need. And so I think there's this importance um, whenever we're actually proactive actively seeking someone out. And when we see the gold in someone, we see what they could be seeing where they're at and what they can start doing now to move them forward to that. So yeah, I yeah. mean, like going by a cemetery is one way to do that, right? Of like, <laughs> Hey, it looks to me like you're a young man who uh, is probably thinking a lot about right now. And there's a life to live that will eventually end, you know, like there's different ways for different people. But for me, it's engaging, it's engaging, especially young men, young women as well in the campuses and in the schools that they're in and seeing what they're doing, how they could be investing more there. And from that place of investing more, the Lord will reveal yeah. more to them. I love that. Aaron, I you're usually, pretty I, intentional. I usually just create a little competition. Mm. I'm, I'm thinking about how do yeah. I, how do I, uh, orient oh, people toward, something. toward greater investment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that I like to communicate either directly or indirectly that <laughs> oh, no. I, I love, I love people easiest or I love, I, it's easier for me to love someone the harder they work. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that, I think that that usually, that usually works well, <laughs> especially for like a group of people who, who wants to be loved by me. <laughs> like, oh, well, if I want to, I'm going to, I want to be hard. engaged, then I got to <laughs> get my butt in gear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There except, is, except for the person who's like, ah, I don't care. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Love yeah. Me or not. But I don't want those ones here. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they don't love me. Leave. No, no. that's awesome. Yeah. The so this is a work. Actually, this is a really fun time because I'm sure Father time. Gabriel. I I see you doing Sister Susan's technique all the time. I, I you're like you're always on these walks with different mm -hmm. uh, missionaries around our campus. And right now we're at our yeah. Equip Conference, which is we have how many missionaries do we have present this week? It's 240. like 240. 240 missionaries for 
for, and we're like preparing them and ready to launch them yeah. into a summer of mission. So it's been a pretty fun conference. What's been your favorite part, Aaron? I have loved the opportunity to be a part of our worship team. Oh yeah. Um, our, our times of worship this week have just been totally off the hook, uh, mm -hmm. both in liturgy and in our, in our times of prayer with small group and, and music and the singing, uh, yeah. as a community, it's, it's just been a, a beautiful, a beautiful opportunity to engage in community mm -hmm. through prayer. Nice. That's mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. I've been really just inspired. Like even like we've, we've been doing this thing for a few years now and it's like, no matter what the, the Lord's making all teachings new. And yeah. there's like this refreshing spirit where it's like, oh, well we've, we've actually covered this before. And yet there's, it's like, he's taking us into new depths. And yep. I, I feel like we're, uh, the, it's just like deeper and deeper and deeper. That whole idea of the Lord's calling us further in, further in, put out into deep mm -hmm. waters, which is yeah. really fun. It, yeah. it's, it's so easy to grow complacent with. It's like, oh, I've heard this before. And mm -hmm. it's like, no, the Lord's actually as a community, yeah. I feel us moving deeper into his heart. And yeah. even with a fresh group, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the students we have here are here for the first time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and they'll be serving as missionaries for the first time. And, uh, to see that, like, you know, the the content and formation that you're receiving this year, it's better than what mm -hmm. wow. our crew received last year, right, right. or the year before. Yeah, because because as we are growing as a community, like we're we're always able to offer the the best of what God's saying now. Um, mm -hmm. which is, which is really cool to see <laughs> yeah. us grow. I love that. That's God. Give us a whole church. So that's mm -hmm. the reality, right? Well, that is the church, right? The church is ever ancient and ever new so that a as we still tie ourselves to all of those elementary principles, like what the CFRs were doing when they stepped out and said, we want to get back to these gospel basics. Yeah. These teachings that have shaped our community are basic to our way of life, yeah. but they're also being rediscovered every single year because as we go further with the Lord, he takes us back to those first principles and says, yeah, and there was also this aspect of that first principle. Yeah. And there was also this aspect of that first principle. Yep. And it's like, it was always there. It was just, we focused on this aspect of it for a long time. And now, well, there's also this stream in this stream that I was speaking out of that foundational yeah. principle. And when that starts flowing, then you start seeing more people come in because mm. they start seeing themselves in that way of life. They're like, oh, that's actually the facet that calls to my heart. Oh, that's actually the stream that I want to reside by, right? Yep. And then all yep. of a sudden you don't only have like the the normal first swath of people who felt called in the beginning, but now it's an entirely new thing with new skill sets, mm. new temperaments, new gifts, Coming in, and it's like the so body of Christ is amazing. Yes, oh, that would be goodness. that would probably be the right, yeah. the right response. <laughs> so, Father, you're kind of like the inside outsider, right? Like you're around mm -hmm. all the time, but like you're you're not like uh, a, a Damascus missionary, clearly. And so, what's what's been your experience of equip so far? It's just a wonderful. It's so easy to be a father here. Mm. It's so easy to be a father here, and it's um, I think the um, the pressure is off because I don't have to do any talks. I preach most days. But otherwise, it's it's just being available, and you're eating lunch, and you're in a walk, and in that <laughs> space, missionaries come up. Father, can you hear my confession? Father, are you available? Father, can we just talk? Father, can you pray? And it's it's so easy. It, they just draw <laughs> it out of you. you know? yep, draw yep. it out of you. It's uh, it's so so life giving. Perpetual so. invitation to <laughs> practice what you're best equipped Perpetual. for. Yeah. <laughs> and there's been a unique. I'm feeling a little bit, I was a little bit nervous coming in because last year we had Father John Ignatius, we had some heavy hitters, Father Jay, <laughs> Brother Priest were with there the whole week. This year it's like, it's just me. Yeah. But it's been this affirmation of um, of the gift of the priesthood because there are moments, oh, I'm the only one who can celebrate Mass. Oh, I'm the only one who can give this blessing. Oh, I'm the only one who, you know, it's like, I can only hear confessions. Okay, yeah. 250 missionaries. Giddy Let's up. go. Let's go. <laughs> I'm not going to sleep tonight. <laughs> St. John Vianney, pray for us. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. Now, the, I was talking to a missionary earlier today, and he was uh, he was just sharing about this uh, moment. It was like four. It was like four years ago. I was at this conference, and as you were speaking, the Lord like put this like hunger and desire for mission in me. And he's like, I, I he's like, I was amazed because I grew up in the church, but I never heard anyone speak about mission. And it was so neat how he was speaking about just like. He said that like something uh, clicked and it, it it started a life of mission for him. And I was just thinking about like that idea that we're all called to mission, but it's possible to go to mass week after week after week to yeah. and almost do the Catholic thing with ever having that trigger inside of you click to give you a heart for the lost, mm -hmm. right? And um, I thought today with Father because your guys' congregation so good at 
uh, seeking out the lost and spending time with the lost. Like Jesus, he says his mission was, he says, like, I've come to seek and save the lost. And so maybe we can just spend some time today talking about like, yeah. how are we called to seek and save the lost and how maybe listeners, if this is your um, time in, if you've been living the faith, but you haven't had that moment where there's been this, like something clicking inside of you to say, I want to seek the lost. I want to give my life for the sake of mission. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I think the Holy Spirit really wants to touch hearts today and actually transform lifestyles today. Yeah. And can we, and can we, paint a picture just for what it means to be lost. Like we, as a people were mm. not made to be lost. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know if you've ever been in like a big city and you see a, a, a child that's lost from their parents, oh, that's a but disaster. It's, 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 yeah, it, it's so heavy on your heart because e- even when, you, even when you go into help, there's so much anxiety and chaos happening that your help can almost be a detriment at times because the, the state that they're in is so foreign to what they were supposed to experience. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I, I think that like to shape this conversation, something that was on my heart as we were going in is just like, we weren't made to be lost because when we're lost, our perspective is entirely different than as it should be. Yeah. And so whenever we're thinking about going into seek and to save what was lost, it's actually to bring things back into right order, right? They're like, when you see that young person that's separated from his or her parents, mm-hmm. right? There's a lack of protection there, right? There, there's... a a, a natural inclination to begin having to fend for yourself. There's a, a a beginning of distrust happening where who can I trust around me? Like, does that not sound familiar in our day-to-day walk with yeah. what we see in the world? That's really good. Right. Point. And so when we paint that picture, because I think sometimes we hear this idea from scripture, this idea from the radical saints of our church of let's go seek and save what was lost. And then we think to ourselves, well, yeah, but um, like, yeah, that, that's a really good calling card. And I, I think that th- they'll get found. Right. But then when yeah. we look at like, no, that state of being lost yeah. is an urgent state. It's always an urgent state. When I see that little one, the first thing I want to do is give them back to their parents. I'm like, yeah. I, I would love if I could find them right now. Yeah. Right. And if we could carry that same heart mm. today, as we introduce and kind of, yeah. I don't know, wrestle with this conversation, I think that'd be appropriate. And good. I'm not sure if it's where the term originates in scripture, but yeah. I know that like Jesus also speaks that um, I've come to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Like hmm. that, um, and and as as we're speaking, I'm 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 thinking that w- we talk about the the imagery of the shepherd and the sheep that Jesus speaks of in John chapter ten. Mm-hmm. That it, it, it's very much an affirmation of our identity. That when we see ourselves as sheep who are oriented to the Lord in such a way that we depend on and we are guided by, our identity is formed by His Word, right? That for for a sheep to be lost is uh, is really a, a scary place mm-hmm. because because it's a it's a separation of the identity. It's like the sheep and the shepherd they really can't be separated, mm-hmm. uh, or else you know how ridiculous is a shepherd without sheep or a sheep mm-hmm. without without a shepherd? Mm-hmm. Um, and and like to to be lost really really implies that like there's a lot more going on than just you've chosen a different path. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But there's actually Brad, as you were mentioning, like there's there's a whole there's a whole separation from my from my security and identity. Yep, it's interesting. I, I think it's funny how the Lord also equates finding the lost with joy, so yeah. that yeah. there will be more joy in heaven over the one lost sheep that yeah. is found, or the the lost coin, right? That once that lost coin is found, you. Uh, and I think it's it's interesting because a, a mark of the CFR community, a mark of our community mm-hmm. is is just joy. That yeah. when yeah. I think when your heart is oriented towards seeking the lost authentically mm-hmm. in the Holy Spirit, you don't have hearts of despair, but you actually have hearts of joy because mm-hmm. you're you're pursuing those lost souls and in your seeing yeah. salvation fall yeah. upon them. Well, and if, if you see, use the example of the little one, yeah, you take that little one, you give them back to their parents. What happens? You walk you're, with a swagger. You're, you're, you're like, so oh, excited (laughs) but then and then look at the kid the kid never knew how much they love their parents yeah there's something in that moment that has them love their parents in a way that they Mm. wouldn't even have loved them had they always been with them oh happy fault right like when we bring them back something happens to everyone involved the parents are like oh like like, you know like the father's like you're home it's like it's like the prodigal son right it's like oh there was there was a place and a room that i had set apart for you but i wouldn't force you into that was empty without you and now you're back there, right, and the kid's like, "Yeah, I'm back, and I'm excited." And you're like, 
I was able to be a part of that. And that's unbelievably. Amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, to watch that hug at that yes. moment is you're just like, whoa, Yes, that yeah. matters. That, ma- that has to matter. Yeah. We know it intrinsically that it matters. And so father what like you guys are all about this as a community and like, uh, how, how would you see the loss? Like, who are they? Mm. Mm. Yeah. It, you don't have to go too far in New York city. Yeah. You know, they're, um, sometimes it's, um, a lot of our neighbors are regulars. They live in uh, government housing right next to us. Um, a lot of them have material means. They're on social security. They have cell phones. And yet they have no contact with their family. Some struggle with mental illness, uh, mm-hmm. drug addiction. And um, and they're just kind of living, but they're not, um, they don't know who they belong to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so being able to, I live in a formation house where it's our, it's our postulancy, the, the guys that were in the first stage of formation, showing them and getting them accustomed to seeking out and praying with the poor and being comfortable yeah. with relating to seeing them not as um yeah not not as someone to be afraid of the exterior uh mm-hmm. experience experience of smelling like urine or un- unshoveled and uh, the needles and the drugs and to be able to what's your name yeah, yeah. what's your name yeah hey what's your story where you're from mm-hmm. uh how long you been here mm. what's uh what do you really desire Mm-hmm. What do you, what are your, and, and beautiful, their hearts open up. Yeah. Their hearts open up. Well, you know, so, I mean, your vineyard is the Bronx, but uh, so many of our listeners, their vineyard's probably a, a, a suburban neighborhood. And I, yeah. from the father's perspective, mm-hmm. there's probably just as many lost sheep in those neighborhoods mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. People who don't know who they are and they don't know what their purpose in life mm-hmm. is. I love how sister Susan asked you, mm-hmm. do you know God's plan in your life? Mm-hmm. And if you don't know God's plan in your life, you're truly lost. Like, mm-hmm. where are you going? Like, you have no direction. And if, if you don't have direction, mm-hmm. like you're, you are the definition of the lost one. And, yeah. but to see See the lost, not from like, oh, like to be able to help the those friars in formation to, to see from the father's perspective that these aren't like a problem over here or they're not drug addicts. They are truly their children. They're yeah. they're God's children who are are um, are are longing for His embrace, and He yeah. more urgently is longing for their embrace. I think even going back to the the parent analogy, like when when you lose a kid as a parent, you you kind of you're, you're kind of a little messed up for a while, you yeah, know, sure. like you freak out. And uh, not that I think the emotional turmoil that may go through a parent's heart <laughs> isn't the emotional turmoil that the God the Father would experience <laughs> since, <laughs> since He's God. Um, but that that pain of uh, am I gonna uh, am I gonna be able to hold this child again? Yeah. Like uh, the the thief comes to steal, slaughter, and destroy, and the enemy has has taken God's children from His hands from the yeah. garden, and and that the Father He has this hunger of like, man, am I gonna see their face again? Am I gonna hold them again? Are they gonna spend eternity with me? That that hunger that the Father would have to be reunited. Yeah, and let's talk about the Father's heart for a minute in that as yeah. well. That like. In the moment where the father sees a son or daughter who is lost, the father is no longer thinking about all the things that led to that son or daughter being lost. Mm. They're thinking about the status of here and now. And I think that would do us so well as church that when we look at the world and we see those who are lost, a lot of times we can think about all the things that led that person to the moment now of being lost. And those things need pastorally cared for over time. I'm not denying that. But what I am saying is if we can focus in that moment at the fact that they're lost, whether it's their fault, someone else's fault, a, a combination of a bunch of people's fault, no matter what, they're in this status of being lost. And the father, when his heart goes out to them, he sees them right where they're at, and he sees a connection point, right? Yeah. Through his son, Jesus, through the gift of the Spirit that we're called to carry. And so what, what we want to be so well to do is to see that person who's lost, see them with the heart of the Father, say, all of the things that got you here, those are so secondary, because yep. you are here, and I want to bring you mm-hmm. here, closer to the Father, to the one who's looking for you, who hasn't taken his eye off of you, and who wants you back. Dan, mm-hmm. I know this this orientation toward ministry is one that's been really passionate for you for a long time. What, where did, where did that get kickstarted in your heart? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would say, hmm, I think the the kickstart was probably um, twofold in seventh grade, where seeing the, um, uh, I went on a mission trip to Cranks Creek, uh, Kentucky, um, and it was a, 
you know, just hanging out with the poor in, in the Appalachia area, mm-hmm. realizing that um, they had more joy uh, than most people I knew and that they had uh, joy because in every conversation they were talking about the goodness of God. And I think there was this hunger to, um, to, to actually, I just seeing God's face in them and wanting to be with, with them. And I would say they weren't, they weren't necessarily, you know, I wouldn't classify them as the lost. They were just the poor. Right. And, uh, but then coming home from that mission trip, then finding my friends who over the next few months, for whatever reason, in our seventh grade class, um, we had a number of students, guys and girls that were cutting their wrists constantly and seeing my friend and another friend and another friend with scars on their wrists. And then mm-hmm. hearing about one friend who wasn't at school because they OD'd on pills and they were in the hospital. And it was like, well, what is going on? And um, I think just that you know, going to my, my mom in desperation, like, mom, like what is going on with my friends? Like, why is everyone so hurt? And having seen Jesus and the joy that Jesus brings, then knowing the desperation that, you know, 12 year olds were in, there was something that triggered in me. Like, mm-hmm. I want to live my life for the sake of others to yeah. bring them the joy of the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. The, I think the, um, I think there's something also just really beautiful of like, uh, if you love Jesus, you want to give him what he's asked for, you know? And I, mm. so I think that the, the fire has inflamed over the years, the more I've fallen in love with Jesus, because, um, I think it's his greatest desire is, mm-hmm. I mean, his entire purpose was salvation of souls. And so if I can enter into his ministry mm-hmm. and give him what he's asking for, like that's yeah. what, what greater joy is there? I love that? that differentiation you made between the poor and the lost mm-hmm. that, um, blessed are the poor in spirit. Mm-hmm. For they will see God. And the the poor and the lost aren't necessarily equatable, but there's things that both sides kind of show us um, in, in like in the poor that they can actually be joyful and have abundance in the Lord, and those with everything can actually be lost and find themselves hidden behind all the possessions they have. But I wonder, Father, you're obviously engaging the poor often, um, and also you. engaging the lost often. Mm-hmm. So I guess when you hear that differentiation, like what comes to mind and, um, your experiences with the the poor and then experiences with the oh, lost, yeah. not yeah. mutually exclusive or inclusive. But right, just, right, right. Yeah. They teach you. I'm just thinking one of our neighbors who's known us from the beginning, Stephen Barnes has been on our block for 30 years and, uh, hmm. he's, he was raised Baptist. He was, uh, never, he's talked about openness to becoming Catholic, but he's gone to uh, some of our ministries, gone to Catholic Underground. He loves adoration. Every prayer now, he ends with a Hail Mary, Hmm. and he has this boldness in praying. Anytime he sees the brothers, any street corner, brother, let's have a word of prayer right there. (laughs) Let's have a word of prayer, and when quiets the neighbors, quiet, everybody, quiet, (laughs) praying, quiet, and close his eyes, Lord God, you say a prayer. And then every prayer, Hail Mary, full of grace. <laughs> with the, and then close. And every time he finishes and he looks up, wasn't that wonderful? Wasn't that wonderful? Mm. It's, it's like, <laughs> he's got it. He's, no, got he's, it. Got. he's also an honest prayer warrior. There was a time where I dropped him off after Catholic Underground. We had a night of adoration and praise and worship and dropped him off. We had uh, some extra donations from benefactors for um, some Chinese food and so I'm like, Steve, would you like some of our food? Yeah, yeah, I'll take some. Here, take some. I'll get some Chinese food. Any salads? I got, okay, take the salad. I see him the next day. Same thing. I'm walking by, walking my car. Father Gabriel. Yes. Can we, get, can we have a word of prayer? All right, all right. We start praying. He goes, he says, Father, we thank you for my friend, Father Gabriel, for that kind food he gave to me, even though that salad was awful. <laughs> <laughs> we start cracking. <laughs> no, indeed, indeed, it was it was a nice gesture, but it was terrible. <laughs> In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Hail awesome. Mary. Yeah, Hail Mary. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So how do you? You're in a formation house, so you you mm-hmm. I, th- that's got to be fun to watch these like guys come to the formation house for the first time in in the Bronx, like and the. Like, what do you do, number one? How do you teach them to reach out to the lost? And then secondly, how do you help foster a heart for the lost mm-hmm. in them, right? Because I, mm-hmm. I'm i sure uh, even the best of them come with a little, like, this oriented towards, like, me, right? Like, mm-hmm. there's this, uh, there's like, I, 
And so how do you help foster that hunger in them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the brothers provide such a beautiful example. It starts out real simple, just coming with us. Okay, mm -hmm. let's make some sandwiches. Let's get some coffee and go out and go out. Uh, we know some spots in the bridge. You can go to parks. Sometimes it's uh, we have a cafe in the friary. And it's it's so relational. It's so relational. And when they start getting that peace, okay, I don't have to worry about what I'm telling them or how I pray. Let's start with relationship. What's their name? What's their story? And building that over time. Can we pray together? What's something you want to pray? Like everyone has a prayer intention. Everyone. Yep. There's something you want to pray for today. Every time, the most beautiful intentions that come out. And then it's when you start in your neighborhood, then they have a heart and eye for seeing them. The, the, when you come out of St. Patrick Cathedral and there's a guy with a, with a sign looking for money. Look, okay, boom, they zoom in. You're on the subway. Someone's asking for money. What's your name, brother? Who has asked them for their name? You know, mm -hmm, yeah. the whole day who has stopped and given them some time. So it's been, um, it's beautiful to see the maturity of mm -hmm. as part of their, part of their healing is going out of themselves, is seeing the eyes with the eyes of the father of, okay, here's my brother in front of me. And it's, it's so Franciscan. Uh, St. Francis talks about in his Testament, looking back on his conversion, uh, the lepers were so important. What before he says, uh, what before was bitter in, in body and soul became sweetness when I encountered them and I embraced them and I kissed mm -hmm. them. So it's like, this is the Franciscan process. You know, mm -hmm. what, be what before is like, ah, how do I relate? How do I interact? This is uncomfortable. And then to see the relationship that's possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. real, uh, it's beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. Was that something yeah. you had to learn in time? Yes. Or did, did you enter with that same heart and focus and desire? There, there, was, uh, there was some good experiences, uh, Catholic Worker House in college, some uh, Appalachian missions. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had to let go of apologizing for myself. Mm. Like, oh, gosh, I come from a place of privilege. Oh, gosh, I can't share that part of myself. <clears throat> and then I realized, no, they just want me to be authentic and share my story and share their story. So it um, mm -hmm. it became simpler and letting go of my own insecurities over time. Yep. And, and then just these beautiful encounters. Yeah, the poor teach you so much. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I just think that e even the way you sp spoke Francis's words, that can be a declaration of prophecy for anyone who's hearing it is getting mm. stirred up. That, that Lord, if it's been bitter for you and hard and difficult for you, the Lord wants to make it sweet for you. And that's that's a promise. That, that, that That's like when you receive the Father's heart, they become your children. And so you're not afraid to touch your child when they're in the hospital bed hurting, yes. right? Like there's there's never a time where where it's hard to embrace your own child. And so to to have the Father's heart, like that's just, that is the transformation He desires to bring us in the Holy Spirit. It is, yeah. I, um, as I've been listening, I was I was thinking about just the um the phrase that we keep using from Jesus that he came to seek and to save what was lost. And I, I had never kind of divided the two verbs that he's using there, right? That he mm. he came to seek the lost and to save the lost. And I wonder if there's a certain kind of loss that he's seeking and a certain kind of loss that he's saving. Because there's sometimes those who are lost in the shuffle of the world who, when sought out, teach us something about God we never would have known otherwise right? Which both of you are speaking to. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I seek those who have found themselves lost in the world, so those in Appalachia or those on the street corners in the Bronx, they might know the Lord unlike anyone I've ever met. And when I seek them as the lost, there's actually a part of me that's lost that gets found again, yep. mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But then there's another group that's actually lost from the fold of God who Jesus came to save, right? And oftentimes those people can be found right in the heart of being found in the world, but being lost in the family of God. Yep. And so it's just interesting to me that, that Jesus, because I've always just th thought of that statement kind of redundantly. And again, I'm just externally processing as I'm thinking about it right now, but he came to seek and to save what was lost. I'm sure that's true with those who are lost from the family of God, but I'm wondering if we take those two verbs, those two actions of what Jesus is doing apart, and we think about this differentiation between the poor and the lost, that sometimes in the poor, they're as found as anyone we've ever met. They're just lost in the world. And sometimes the ones who are so involved in everything in the world or are as lost as anyone we've ever met. I was, I was thinking back to when Jesus, I, I don't know if it's the first time he says this in the gospel of Luke, but when he sees Zacchaeus, right? Zacchaeus, like he, he has wealth in the world. Like, yes, yes. He's kind of like not, ex <laughs> like he's not ex super accepted by his people, but he's doing okay. Right. And, um, but he's hiding and Jesus finds him and he says, I came to seek and to save what was lost. Right. And he, and he seeks out and Zacchaeus is like, I'll give back 
more more than more what, than what I, I had. More than what yeah. I had, yeah. It's irrational. And so there's something about like, well, was that generosity already in his heart? And when he was sought out, did that generosity come to the forefront? Mm. And did that save him by the fact that he was sought out? And like just just looking at that interplay anyway. Yeah. And I, I think that what you guys are speaking to, so many people can relate to that we've we've met people who seem to have nothing, that have a widow's might, but they add something so valuable to us and help us find something yeah. in ourselves. And then we've we've seen those who um who who I think the Lord's developed my heart for that have so much available to them. But man, behind that, it's like what what satisfies you though? Yeah. And it's like, I'm not sure if you've mm. found that yet. Yeah. I think even, uh, I mean, I, I see the fruit here in our missionary program too, that we'll, we'll have a lot of uh, individuals who will apply for our full-time program who don't really yet have a great love or heart for the type of outreach that we do, right? That, mm-hmm. that there's not a, there's not a huge focus on youth ministry outreach, but as you say yes to mission, your heart is transformed and oriented toward the heart of Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, it, it all goes in cycles. So, like, if if you're finding that that you feel like there's maybe a, a lack of focus or a lack of proper orientation of heart, like, all the better reason to say yes to mission, to engage yourself in a place where I know I'm going to be stretched, mm-hmm. but I'm going to be perfected mm-hmm. and brought brought closer into relationship with the heart of Jesus so I can carry it as my own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's That's that awesome. been like for you to see that transformation over the months and years to see? I think it's awesome. You know, the uh one of my one of my very favorite things to see every year and I'm sure these guys can can affirm that is that our our second year full-time missionaries at the start of our at the start of our second mission year in in September October um it's it's like they're a completely different person from the awesome person that they came in as the year before, mm-hmm. and there's just there's a certain uh, maturity mm-hmm. and and a diversity of of scope and vision and kind of the the rough edges have worn off a little bit, and it, it all boils down to the fact like I I was I was learning my I was learning what boundaries I could push in my in my first year here to to stake my own claim, mm-hmm. and now I realize I'm a part of a community. And my and my job truly is to is to invite others in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's just it's awesome. There was a death to self, you know, like they yeah. they they died, and you almost just see them living Jesus. You know yeah. that there's yeah, it's just beautiful to see that the transformation that I am I am now missionary. Like their their mindset has removed from mm-hmm. interior to exterior. That I'm looking outward at all times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and it's hard to do that. I think in the the speed of life right that like mm-hmm. because so often in life you That's you have good, to like go word. inward 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 just to survive mm-hmm. right yeah. like especially in the young adult years it's like oh my gosh what am i studying mm-hmm. am i are my grades good enough like what's what's your plan for your future what's your career like all mm-hmm. of this and there's all this inward looking that like you have to take this time or reposition even if you're mm-hmm. not a full-time mm-hmm. missionary at damascus mm-hmm. daily reposition yourself as a full-time missionary wherever god's put you yeah. so that you wake up and clothe yourself with Christ, and mm-hmm. his eyes are always outward. Yep. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Yeah. Right? That, that he, we he actually, knew what he was talking we about. Actually, yeah. <laughs> we actually, beca- we actually I, I don't know, I'm, I'm just being struck with where this conversation's going because the Lord's just doing something new in my heart that I, I've never thought about it through the lens of like, it's actually me who's lost when I'm trying to save my life, right, mm-hmm. by myself. But it's actually when I lose my life for the Lord's sake that I have, in fact, saved it. And then I'm bringing other people into that salvific work of Jesus. They're like, my, my life is no longer my own. I'm not coming inside and just focusing in on what I need and what I want. I'm looking at what you need and what you want. And I'm trying to provide that yeah. to the best of my God given ability in this moment right now for what you need as the person there that the father wants back into his embrace. Yeah. And like, if we can, if we can go there, right? Like for all of us, religious life, married life, missionary life, ministry life, secular life, whatever, we can begin really, really, I think, partaking actively in that call of Jesus to seek and save what was lost. But I'm just wondering, where's ministry easier or where do you see Holy Spirit moving more when you're on the streets in the Bronx um, or when you're at a random Catholic high school somewhere in suburban America? Mm-hmm. I don't get to too, too many high schools. Uh, the, um, the gift of, of the poor, they're so real. Mm-hmm. They're so real, and it's a great, uh, authentic place to engage. And sometimes the um, for the youth or the young, that you have to dig a little bit. You gotta, yeah. you know, it takes a little warming up too. And um, both have their um, 
uh, both are invitations to fatherhood. Yes. You know, both are invitations to, to accompany and walk with. Uh, with the poor, sometimes it can take, you know, a little bit longer, yeah. a little bit longer, but um, it's, uh, yeah, it's totally worth it. Totally yeah, I think that that's a, that's a really good point. It takes longer with the poor, but maybe harder to break into the the, the non-poor, right? This, mm-hmm. And, and the, uh, I'm just, if you were like, oh, shoot, I really want mission, that doesn't mean you have to move to the Bronx to get mission, right? <laughs> that that there the actually like wherever you're planted there is a deep need and and exactly the way you form your brothers that like it starts with a relationship and mm-hmm. so wherever you are there's a deep deep need for mission and it always starts with a relationship and mm-hmm. and i think sometimes the there's like you said there's an authenticity and an openness with the poor where they're just like mm-hmm. i love doing street evangelization because it's like everyone wants to talk when you're on yes. the like streets on the west mm-hmm. side or at a gas station mm-hmm. and not only do they want to talk they want to be prayed with you know whenever yeah, you're yes. like and though sometimes i'll be like hey do you have a prayer intention and they're like oh you want to pray they'll wrap my, their arm around you and they're <laughs> yeah, like ready yeah, yeah. to go all of a sudden they're laying hands on me i'm like what do you do like and so like it's just like because they're so mm-hmm. there's that openness whereas like if i like try to like ask a, a co-worker sometimes in a secular environment do you want to pray it's probably awkward how, and how many so, co-workers have you had in a secular never environment actually, <laughs> last, last time i worked in the secular world i was 18 so <laughs> so it's been bob a minute <laughs> get on the I farm did try to come on bob evans kit like uh, waitresses and waiters and cooks. I believe that it was it was an adventure. Just let the sweet tea convert them. That's yeah. what yeah. happened about yeah. endless but, hot chocolate. Um, yeah. I know yeah. bottomless. It's amazing. It is so good. I almost um, lost my job. They were like, uh, "You can't you can't wear your cross on the outside of your clothes." I said, "I can't hide the cross." And then this manager was like, "Well, what do you mean?" I was like, "Well, you're asking me to put the cross away. I refuse to do that." Uh, and he's like, "Oh, well." Uh, Okay, I guess you can keep it out. Then. Hey, good job, Dan. Um, good job, eighteen-year-old Dan. I think um, one thing you were talking about there, Dan, and I think uh, <laughs> it's it's well to say that that yeah, that that mission that Jesus is calling us to is available in every season of our life, wherever we're planted. That Nina and I, um, my wife and I, and Father, we just um, moved into a suburb um, north of Columbus, and as we're we're moving into this neighborhood, one thing I'm recognizing in myself, and something I mentioned to Nina, is I, I want to spend more time on the front porch than the back porch that like we have a front porch and there's kids and families that walk around our community all of the time but everyone in our community has an amazing back patio right like an amazing backyard and we have a, a lovely back patio and, and I love spending time on that with Nina and there's a place for that but I want to spend more time even if I'm with her on the front porch than I do on the back patio simply because there's this orientation outward that actually engages people where they're at because what I what I noticed is e- even in like a couple of weeks of living there I would like walk into the garage door and close it right behind yeah, me and no it's one, like no it, it's, it's like a glorified bed and breakfast and it's like no 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 I like there's something about being together there's something about like investing here. There's something about pouring into one another that's important. And so, yeah, just wherever you're at, I I would encourage anyone listening, like, yeah, we might be talking about the poor today. We might be talking about the loss that you think might have to be found somewhere where they're outright rejecting God openly and evangelizing towards atheism or something. Um, But rather... The lost can be found literally on the in sidewalk, walking around, walking your their dog. Yeah. Yes, I think, seriously. I th- so I guess for for the typical demographic who's listening to our show, like it, it's important probably for us to do both, right? Mm. And and maybe sure. I'll, I'll I'll toss that in there that like there have been, uh, you know, my my orientation in ministry these days doesn't get me out on the street often. Yeah. But what I found is that it's critical that I actively pursue opportunity mm-hmm. to put myself in it's those places of discomfort mm-hmm. so that I can continue to stretch that muscle, yeah, that's good. right? And mm-hmm. and and continue to put myself in a place where I'm like, okay, um not only do I need exposure, not only do I need insight, but there's a part of me that that was made for a particular mission and if I never put myself there, mm-hmm. then I'm I'm worse off and and there's a a need that goes unserved. Yeah. Um and then the second piece, though, too, is you know, as we've been talking about here at the conference the last the last few days, we are truly in a time of transition in our nation, mm-hmm. where uh, if we're speaking about lost in terms of um, ease of access or intimacy in relationship with Jesus, like the 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 tide is turning to the point where our suburban neighborhoods are very soon going to be a a place of lost individuals who mm-hmm. simply have not have not. Uh, entered into serious dialogue of introduction to the gospel. Mm-hmm. So, like, we need to be on mission 
both in our place of yeah. of of comfort. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, seek out opportunity. I'm thinking mm-hmm. here in here in Columbus, whether it's yeah. whether it's that mission trip in the in the Appalachian Mountains, or mm-hmm. whether whether it's meeting up with an urban outreach like uh, like um, Urban Encounter. Urban yeah. Encounter. Thank you. Or or it's which gas station do you go to, right? Like the <clears throat> we were driving home from ballet one night, and my 13 year old daughter she says, "Dad, why do you always drive through the scary neighborhood instead of taking the freeway?" Yeah. And I was like, Sophia, because the scary neighborhood is so beautiful, right? That <laughs> I love to see the broken windows. I love to see the boarded mm-hmm. up homes. I love to see the people on the streets because it gives me the sensitivity of the heart. And so yeah. when I'm not with Sophia, right? Yeah. I, I take those same streets. I stop at those same gas stations. And those are the people you relate with. So your windows are down and you're able mm-hmm. to talk to them and, ta- and get to know the homeless person's name, right? Mm-hmm. And you're able to stop at that ga- gas station and have conversations. Yeah. with the people there so that they're not That's scary sweet. and they're not and it's so easy to just okay this is the nicer like and we yeah. do it right like there's two different gas stations there's the nice yeah. one and then there's the the not so nice one and we always choose by by um autopilot the nice one as opposed to gas is going to be the same price of both they're both like nine dollars a gallon so just go <laughs> go to the one that push puts you depends on the show I heard <laughs> yeah right <laughs> but no i i hear that i i do i i think that's a that's a point well taken aaron because i think it's actually in stretching ourselves in in ways like what the cfrs are doing right like that's what permits us who find ourselves in the laity living in a suburban neighborhood to always be outward facing. Yeah. If I never stretch that muscle, then I'll, I'll slowly get comfortable into the place of yeah. complacency. It's only when I go out and kind of stretch that, that I'm then like, well, am I having that disposition all the time? No. Well, I could implement that into my daily life. Yep. It's actually those unique circumstances that bring us back into the ordinary That's good. circumstances. Yeah, got, uh, you know, one of the popular phrases I always use in ministry is, well, you can't you can't pray without ceasing or you can't pray at all times mm-hmm. if you don't pray at some times, mm-hmm. right? And you mm-hmm. can't you can't be intentional about mission at all times if you're not intentional about mission at, at specific, specific times. times yeah. And so there do, there there are times where you have to be specific to condition yourself to be intentional mm-hmm. all the time. And mm-hmm. okay, before we close, I think it's really important to talk about something, um, perseverance. And so, mm. Father, you're ministering to people and the same people in, in your neighborhood. And mm. uh, and when when someone is in, in, in poverty or when someone's in addiction, it's really hard for them to break out of that and have a transformed, renewed lifestyle. So how do you guys minister to people and persevere? And like, man, we didn't love in this guy for like five years, 10 years, and it's still the same guy on the same corner and living the same life. And how do you persevere in that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I take courage in uh, St. Paul's words, you know, one waters, another, another sows. Uh, I might not see the fruit. I might not see the fruit, but God has my part to play in those relationships. And can I be one part in his journey to the Lord? And through his, their encounter with the brothers, through their encounter of uh, Brother Colby's kindness and giving him, I see so many miraculous medals in our neighborhood. It's <laughs> yeah. incredible. And there's Brother Colby who hand, you know, ties the knots and gives out these medals and gives out these rosaries and all over our neighborhood, mm-hmm. all over our neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Will they become Catholic? Maybe not. But will have they experienced um, an encounter and a relationship with Jesus that they, they and even a home that they can go to and and know when the time is right, I think so. I think so. So, um, Stephen, Stephen, still he has the last year he had uh, he needs a liver transplant, so he's asked. I think I'm gonna become Catholic. You know, he's he's asked that. Wow. So wow. we're it's yeah. it's taken a while, but he's yeah. open. So yeah. he, you know, that's it's not it's not ours for to, to know the fruit to see mm-hmm. the fruit always, but um, we mm-hmm. have our part. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. awesome. I love that. I always pray for a person's the the yeah that that death that death second. You know, like what's going to happen in that mm-hmm. moment? And mm-hmm. did all that watering and all that sowing of the seed like like what takes place in that death moment, right? And mm-hmm. if if they if like in that surrender uh, into the arms of the Lord, His mercy um, it just covers them, and it's just that it fills me with so much hope that. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't have to worry about anything because yeah. mm-hmm. if I do my part, like the Lord is going to show up with mercy and grace mm-hmm. in that moment. And all that tilling of the soil has prepared that soul to receive that mm-hmm. mercy and grace in that moment. And then it'll be great because you'll see them in heaven. And yes. when you get there, they're going to be like, hey, I'm here because of you. And in heaven, yes. everyone's Catholic, right? <laughs> and, 
and the church is fulfilled. And so, uh, so it, it, it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. What yeah. about you, Brad? Like, what's your perseverance plan? Yeah. So I, I, I love Romans five. And as soon as someone brings up perseverance, I always go there. Right. That, that like, we all have these afflictions in our life, like the, these aff- afflictions of life that happen to us. Um, but also afflictions of our heart for like the life we see, like, like, I mean, I'm, I'm afflicted with this, this pain for like people that I want to know the Lord, right? These afflictions and um, St. Paul so good to instruct us that um, we can even boast of such afflictions, right? Knowing that affliction produces what? Endurance, right? So I have to endure through afflictions and through misunderstandings and through the wrestles of my day-to-day life. When I do that, I gain this endurance that allows me to work on my virtue and my character because that's what he says next, right? Endurance produces proven character and then proven character, what? Hope and hope does not disappoint. Um, and like within all, all of like all of these things, we see that um, Paul's pointing us unto um, just perseverance that like, if we can stay in, if we can stay in our day-to-day life, the things that we're struggling with, the things we're having great success with that, like that, that perseverance through that will allow us to endure, which will allow us to develop a character that makes us look more like Jesus. And from that proven character, it'll give us hope. And that's kind of like Mm. what I, what I set my anchor in is that I, I have so much hope that Jesus actually will be victorious in every person's life. And so I, I'm just hold on to that hope that I'm going to go into this scenario and I'm going to be the best possible representation of Jesus that Brad can muster up at this time. And Lord, I have hope that you're going to work through that yeah. and you're going to work in that to bring this person to yourself. And I, and I, I don't know, there's something about hope that when we can actually take grasp of that. And again, Romans five, it gives us the recipe to find hope. And if we can hold on to that hope, we can persevere. Amen. Yeah. Dan, you and I, in our, in our early years in youth ministry, we always used to talk about how it's, it's not so much that there was a particular gift that, that separated us apart or that set us up for success, but it was just that commitment to keep saying yes and keep showing up every time. And when others who may have even been more gifted initially Stopped or at least around. less politically incorrect than me. <laughs> that's that's true. They, <laughs> that's also correct. I was redeemed, guys. You know a bit. Uh, that that we just we we kept showing up every yeah. every summer and every Sunday yeah. and um and I think that's that's a real mark that that mm-hmm. if if you're wondering okay how do I how do I create a ministry do I have to enter the CFRs to minister to the poor no. Just, oh, but if you're 21 to between 21 and 35, <laughs> grow a beard, give me a call. Yes. Yeah, me too. If you'd stop, like to be a missionary, then we can send stop them off, off the CFRs. We have, we have the Damascus <laughs> Missionary Recruiter, and we have the Vocations Director for the CFRs. This is dangerous. Do you think this is accidental? <laughs> Check the show notes to learn more. Yeah. A- anyway. That's a sweet word. I mean, just, yeah. just keep, keep doing it, man. What's the answer keep to successful min- ministry? Never give up. Never, Never give up. Give up. Show, show up every yeah. day. Show yeah. Up. Show up every day. Yeah. And it's it's the I have one of my new favorite quotes is the secret to missionary yeah. work is work right and I just I love that because <laughs> it's not easy and so like let's like like it's the Lord says I want you to labor in my vineyard with Amen. me yeah. and so yeah. there like it takes it takes effort and mm-hmm. so show, not giving up showing up day after day and I think that's um, if I I want us to close in prayer but I think the um, it, to brag on us not in a in a cocky way but in a, a way that brags on God I. We, I think we have four people at this table who our lives are fully dedicated to the proclamation of the gospel and the mm-hmm. advancement of the kingdom, right? Night mm-hmm. and day, year after year after year, surrendered to the Lord. And I know, Aaron, you're not going anywhere, right? Brad, I know you're not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Father, I know you're not going anywhere, right? And mm-hmm. these are lives that are surrendered for the rest of our lives yeah. mm-hmm. to pour out for the gospel. And I wonder, especially any young people or or any people young in faith that are hungry for a lifestyle of mission that is not ending, that I am going to persevere till the last day of my days. Um, if we could pray uh, for that fire of mission to stir up in, in the listeners, yeah. and if we could pray for fire of mission to persevere mm-hmm. in their lives. Mm. Father, since you're the priest, I guess your prayers are... Can I just bless? Yeah. Let's just look at the blessing on there, because that'll work. I think yeah. that'll work. Yeah, 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 yeah. That works. All right, Lord God, we just ask for your Holy Spirit to be poured Ooh. upon us and upon all our listeners, that the fire with which you enkindled your Son uh, may burn within us, however small that it may continue to grow through the breath of the Holy Spirit, continue to enkindle us 
uh, desire in the heart of the Father to pursue and to seek out and to save those who are yes. lost. And we just pray for those in our own family members, our communities and friendships, that uh, we just have eyes to see what you see mm-hmm. and to pursue how you pursue, how you pursued us. Mm-hmm. And so I just ask you, Lord, your abundant blessing upon all those present, those who are listening. May Almighty God bless you and keep you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Well, thanks for having thanks, me on Father. here. It's yeah, great. it's great. And if you are a young man interested in the CFRs, you can reach hey, out to... 21 and 21 to 35. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do they get a hold of this? You guys don't have, like, anything, do you? Well, send in their, their beard yeah. picture first. What's the, the beard, beard line? Send yeah, in yeah, the beard picture yeah. first. We, we only have That's to cover the beard picture. at least three inches before we even... Spend some time with the Amish, get some tips. Yeah. All right. CFRs, just look them up up in the Bronx. You probably just have to go knock on your door. That's, That's pretty yeah. accurate. All right, you've been listening to Beyond Damascus, the show where encounter meets mission. We hope that your encounter with Jesus leads you to a life mm-hmm. of mission. Check out this show uh, wherever podcasts are found. And if you want, share it with your friends. Um, and if you don't want, still share, still share it with yeah, your friends. Yeah, that'd be great too. Uh, that would be awesome. <laughs> okay. And uh, we'll join, join us next week. Thank you so much. God bless.